You're listening to The Full Story. Hello, I'm John Yip. Ukraine and Russia have agreed to establish a humanitarian corridor following a second round of talks over the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. But an advisor to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said the negotiations in Belarus did not achieve all the results they were hoping for. Mr. Zelensky called on his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, to sit down with him for face-to-face talks. At the news conference, Mr. Zelensky asked, What are you afraid of? Russian forces have continued the heavy bombardment of the southern Ukrainian city of Mariupol and the eastern city of Kharkiv. But they've only managed to capture one major city, Kherson. In the televised opening of a National Security Council meeting, the Russian president claimed that his invasion into Ukraine is going according to plan. Charles Gibson with more. We've had uh, President Vladimir Putin meeting with his uh, Security Council here in the Russian capital. Uh, He has said that in his belief the Ukrainians and the Russians are one people. Uh, He's also been talking about the special military operation Uh, That's the phrase that the Kremlin is sticking to rather than uh, using the word invasion to describe what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, He's saying that that operation is going to plan and is on schedule. Uh, Of course, we have intelligence from the UK, from the US uh, and other Western allies to suggest that that is not the case, that the Russians have encountered much more resistance than they were perhaps uh, expecting. Uh, We also, as you were mentioning there, uh, have had these latest round of talks wrap up between the Russians uh, and the Ukrainians. The Russians are saying uh, that they have talked about a possible temporary ceasefire uh, around humanitarian corridors. So uh, people in cities such as Kiev and Kharkiv that are just getting bombarded uh, over the last few days or so, they will be able to uh, hopefully in the next few days be able to leave safely. Uh, They have also, the two sides, according to the Russians, uh, talked about creating some channels in order to organise exactly how those uh, humanitarian corridors are going to work. Uh, The Ukrainian side being much more cautious, uh, saying that they didn't get exactly what they were hoping for out of this second round of talks, but they have agreed to sit down with the Russians again for a third round, uh, no confirmation yet about, uh, you know, which day, what time, when that third round is going to be. In the meantime, there has been overwhelming global condemnation of Russia's actions in Ukraine, with 141 members of the UN General Assembly, including Singapore, voting in support of a resolution to demand that Russia withdraws all of its military forces immediately, completely and unconditionally. The result is a symbolic victory for Ukraine and further isolation for Russia, which has already been hit by a raft of international sanctions. One Singaporean who is in Moscow right now said quite simply that it's been tough. He's Nigel Lee, an undergraduate studying at the Moscow State Institute of International Studies, and he joins me now on The Full Story. Hello, Nigel. Thanks for joining me. I suppose we can begin with a very simple question. Why, of all the places in the world, have you chosen to study international relations in Moscow? Well, if I get that question, every time I get that question, I was paid a dollar, I'd definitely be more than a millionaire. Um, It's, uh, you see, the reason why I wanted to come here in the beginning, um, I studied in the Singapore American School, and I was always fed this uh, Western perspective of which, um, you know, are valid and, and uh, necessary to understand. And during that time, we were always learning about Russia, the Soviet Union, the evil empire. And of course, um, while I was a high school student, the whole Ukrainian crisis happened and Russia was so quickly uh, villainized um, like it is now. Of course, now we're in a very different situation. I came here because I wanted to really see what Russia was like. Um, I wanted to go beyond what uh, Churchill said. It was a riddle wrapped in a mystery, wrapped in an enigma or something like that. I want to break through this imaginary iron curtain that still existed, I would say, even after the end of the Cold War. I want to find the truth. And it seems that uh, the past uh, few days, um, that truth has become very, very blatant to me and to all of us around the world. That's very admirable. And how does it feel to be studying international relations? at a time when real-world events are sorely challenging everything you have assumed about how statecraft is conducted? Um, it's definitely uh, 
interesting. On one hand, uh, you know, you really get to finally see how developments uh, uh, are take take place uh, while studying international relations. So we're we're talking about it in class, and you know, we're moving beyond just theory. Um, of course, it's also quite heavy because you realize you're not just talking about some conflict in some far off, you know, desert uh, nation or some African nation, but something that's actually in Europe, in a part of the world that is so connected to all of us. Um, and for me in Russia, uh, it's very personal. And so when I'm studying international relations here, you're seeing it unfold, you're always learning from it. Um, and it's definitely challenged my theoretical understanding of international relations. Of course, you know, we when we learn uh, study international relations, we're always told it's theoretical, states always act differently sometimes, but um, you're told that states act rationally, as rationally as they can, and they make calculated decisions, and especially like Russia, as we've observed a leader like Vladimir Putin, we always would have always seen it as a very calculated, per calculative person. Now, it's hard to um, believe that you know, war is becomes a calculated necessity. Uh, war is always a very uh, violent and emotional um, uh, time, and the decision for war uh, is definitely not one done so so easily. Um, so that that's the best I can answer to to that question, because I'm also I'm also asking mm. you know that to myself, you know, as as the situation develops. So you've gone all the way to Russia. You've entered uh, this university or this institute mm -hmm. in Moscow to see what things are really like over there. And as I mentioned, the world is condemning Russia, specifically President Vladimir Putin, for his actions. But how are ordinary Russians responding to the war in Ukraine at this point in time? What do you see? Well, that's a very good question. Um, as far as my observations go, ordinary Russians, so people, I would say, who don't really care much about politics or you know or about foreign policy um i think there's definitely a great unease in a lot of uh, russians um but i think for it's it's very different generationally for the younger generation people like me um, born in 99 after millennials etc um they are seeing a russia that they understood and knew to change drastically um just the past few days uh large corporations and uh, brands, brand names that we're familiar with, Apple, Ikea, uh, even Coca-Cola, all these uh, car companies, Ford, Volkswagen, et cetera, they have all announced that they'll stop, um, cease business in Russia for the time being. And so for us integrated in this very globalized world, uh, we, we many of my friends are now saying, good God, we're going to live in in another North Korea. But in terms of the older generation, those that lived through the fall of the Soviet Union, the very troubling times of the 1990s, where Russia was transitioning from uh, communism to uh, free market capitalism, um, I think they take it in their stride, definitely. And um, they're, they're unfortunately perhaps used to it. And as such, I've seen long lines um, in front of uh, currency exchange um, kiosks. I've seen long lines at ATMs. I've been in those lines for ATM uh, for for cash at ATMs. Um, you see people. Um, I remember seeing people rushing to jewelry stores just so they they can you know buy something that has uh, value that they can exchange later on if the Russian ruble continue, continues to fluctuate. Um, so I think right now most Russian people, ordinary Russian people, are really just looking out for for their livelihood and and to ensure that they survive and get through this with as little hardship as possible. Is there a view and is it predominant that Russia is a victim in this whole process? Uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is a very sensitive question because um, look, the, the Russian media and the Russian the official Russian position is that uh, they needed to go into Ukraine to stop uh, this humanitarian disaster against Russian-speaking people. 
to stop this genocide in Eastern Ukraine. And as such, it was necessary to go in to denazify the country. This is Putin's words. Um, as far, so as far as the action in Ukraine, mil special military operation in Ukraine, they see it as kind of this necessity to go in. As far as the sanctions are um, of the Russians who are very proud that I spoke to, um, some even my own teachers, they say that we'll weather through this, we can do it, we won't need you know, these foreign companies to be here. We can make our own products, we can do it. Um, I think for the younger generation, it's just resignation because they really don't have any power to, to change the direction that things are going currently. Well, the sanctions against the Russian banking system are definitely starting to bite. How has it affected you personally and in what other ways is it uh, also affecting you? Um, I think the first uh, thing that affected, how it affected me was realizing that uh, I probably might not need to return back to a cash-based uh, way of buying things. Um, I became so used to it here in Russia and even in Singapore, right? We, you know, using cashless system. So I had to take my money and uh, put it in a tin box under my bed. And I recall stories from my grandparents that during the Second World War, when the Japanese occupied Singapore, they were doing the same. And now doing it, I kind of laughed at myself that, good God, I'm, I'm not doing this out for fun. I'm, I'm, I really have to do this because we don't know when, um, uh, for example, Singapore will, will sanction certain banks uh, that will prevent me from using uh, my Singapore card, for example. Um, in other areas, of course, prices have gone up. I remember uh, just yesterday, I bought a kilo of cucumbers. It costs about 150 rubles. Uh, I think that's a triple or double in price of, of what it used to be. Um, so it's, it's starting to, to trickle in the effects of these sanctions. Um, and uh, my main concern really is, is for the Russian people and how, how they, will, they will experience it. Because for me, I mean, if really things go bad, I can leave, right? Or if not, I can still use my Singapore dollar. Thank God for that. Um, so honestly, the way it's affected me, it's more on a very emotional level because I've become so close to the people here, I've really started to understand their mindset, how they deal with difficulties. And I understand that it won't be easy. What is the student mix like at the institute that you're studying in? And uh, you've talked about the emotional bonds that you've already formed with them. Some of the international students there, they're already planning to leave. Are you planning to do the same? Um, so as far as uh, the international body here in uh, my university, in my institute, um, it's, a, it's quite a vast uh, uh, group, um, you know, save what's happening now and save the COVID pandemic. Uh, we've always had a very diverse student body. We've had students and because of the nature of this university, it is tied with the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It is the training ground of future Russian diplomats and diplomats from um, former Soviet states. Uh, so you have a lot of international students from places that I would never have uh, uh, met if I went to a Western institution. they are Kazakhs, Kyrgyz students, North Koreans even, South Ossetians, Abkhazians. It's, it's, it's really amazing. Um, as far as students that have already left, um, the exchange students from Western, uh, Western countries, France, Italy, Germany, et cetera, they have uh, mostly left. Um, as for me, uh, I am quite weary of leaving because I left uh, two years ago when COVID first started and, and I continued with my studies online for a year in Singapore. Uh, I wouldn't say it was optimum and there was a reason again why I wanted to come to Russia to, to see this country uh, firsthand and I think now, as things are unfolding, I'm, uh, if I say with some degree of guilt, a bit enticed to continue to just see how things unfold with my very own eyes. So I'm not so um, eager to go back yet. I'm sure this is something that will stay with you for the rest of your life. It's such a, it's an experience that I don't think. Well, let's hope you'll never have to see such an experience ever again, since it is indeed a very trying time. But what will you take away most from everything that you are going through right now? You know, I, I, 
I don't want to challenge what you said there, but I disagree that maybe, maybe this won't, you know, that I hope this won't be the last time. I, I don't think this will be the last time. The world is definitely becoming more insecure, more unstable. Um, you know, going through COVID, uh, we already kind of, everyone in the world experienced this uh, radical change in our lives and our understanding of global of this globalized world. Um, for me here in Russia, while this war is happening, uh, waking up and to read the news that, that Putin had announced this special military operation, it shocked me to my core because you you think war is always the last thing that people do. And, um, you know, I love I have always loved war movies. I've always loved the whole history of World War II. And what I've always been so touched by were the war stories, you know, of soldiers and of people back in the home front um, writing letters to each other and, you know, praying for each other. And now I just think of the Russians and Ukrainians who are experiencing this. You know, how many, how many mothers will have will 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 have to mourn the loss of their sons? How many children will uh, grow up, uh, you know, uh, in 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 fear of of bombs and and missiles. And this is definitely not the world that I wanted to inherit, you know, as a as an adult. But sometimes, and I think this is the lesson for me, is that we don't have a choice on what kind of fate we we inherit, um, and we just have to make do with what we have and continue to make the world at least try to make the world a better place for, for the children that we will have. And in terms of me as a Singaporean, the experience is that, well, we are very, very blessed to have a country like Singapore, to have systems and institutions and a government uh, and a very safe and prosperous life. And, you know, things can change overnight. So we should really count our blessings, but also be ready to protect what we have. Nigel Lee is an undergraduate studying at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Nigel, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. You can read more about his experience on CNA.Asia. Look for the article, Singaporeans in Russia Cope with the Changes After Invasion of Ukraine. Still to come, what does protecting biodiversity have to do with the fight against climate change? That's coming up after the news. 